Uh, and this this is one of a series of webinars. Uh, they're organized by Region 2, uh, and uh, they're uh, free to attend. I think we get people from different places uh, coming to listen to what's going on. Uh, today, we've got uh, a panel of three. Um, uh, John Papworth uh, is a very active and very well-known dispute board member uh, and a quantity surveyor by training. Uh, and he uh, sits in many boards. He's got uh, substantial experience of how all of this works in practice and how it works well, because he's in charge of it. And he's a uh, previous uh, UK representative for the DRBF as well. Um, we also have with us uh, from uh, interrupting FIDIC training, actually, um, taking some time out. Instead of having lunch, she's going to talk to us. Uh, and that's Victoria Tyson, who's a construction lawyer. Uh, she's now a partner with Howard Kennedy uh, and deals with contentious construction issues. And that includes uh, exactly what we're talking about now, which is dispute boards and how those work in practice, what goes on, uh, what's good, what's bad. And she's got very substantial experience in uh, guiding parties through that process. Uh, and uh, I'm moderating today. My name's Andrew Agley and B. I'm also a construction lawyer. I practice from my own firm, Agley and B ADR. Uh, my practice involves uh, a, a fairly similar description to Victoria's. I end up um, advising parties in, in disputes, including disputes that go to dispute boards and becoming involved in those. Uh, and I also sit as an arbitrator. So uh, the, the purpose of today, or the, the headline of today, is to talk about uh, guerrilla tactics. And these are not, you know, hair, hairy creatures who live in mountains. These, these are guerrillas like freedom fighters or terrorists, depending which side you're on. Uh, they're people who uh, sometimes fight a bit of asymmetric warfare, and they, they take a, a weak position and try and make it strong by adopting unconventional tactics. And it's a phrase that was used a few years ago in um, the context of uh, arbitrations, where it was thought that uh, sometimes people use the rules which were there to protect the process, uh, but they didn't use the rules to protect the process, they used the rules to try and disrupt or to defeat the process. And uh, that uh, that was a misuse of the rules in some way. And uh, certainly in, in my practice and experience, I've come across things which look as if they could be that sort of misuse of rules and uh, the, the use of processes to disrupt the overall progress and effectiveness of the dispute board process. So I thought it would be a good idea uh, to start by saying, I regard that as a bad thing. And this is not a how to, uh, how you could go about disrupting any dispute board you find yourself in. And uh, I, I would say as a, uh, uh, you know, having done this for almost 40 years now, that one gets one gets to have the the spider senses tingling when people are doing things which uh, are intended to disrupt. It's it it's it's something which people looking at it uh, understand might be uh, a tactic to disrupt. So it's quite difficult to carry out guerrilla tactics without people thinking that's might that might be what you are doing. Uh, and you know, may, maybe some people don't care, but uh, does it have an impact uh, on quite how the process might run and the decisions might be reached? That's a question. Um, so as a last introductory comment, I would say this is meant to be a discussion and it means that uh, the, the people presenting are going to put things forward for discussion. It doesn't mean that their heartfelt personal belief uh, is reflected in what they're saying. So uh, you can't take away from this, oh, well, on that, on that call, they said this. 
So that's what they really believe. We're, we're here to discuss, which does mean identifying other positions, uh, even if we don't believe that they're correct, and stating what they are to allow the discussion to go ahead. So um, we're, we're, we're not setting out our heartfelt personal views. I, I, I don't mean we're going to say things um, which which are illogical, but uh, we, you know, don't don't hold us to everything. It's for the purpose of discussion. Uh, you you might have some questions as you go through, and this this Zoom platform, which you're probably all familiar with, uh, has got at the bottom of it two boxes. It's got a Q and A box, and it's got a chat box. And the Q the Q and A box is the question and answer box. And that's where your questions should go if you've got any. And uh, we will keep an eye on that box uh, and we'll go through uh, at least some questions. I don't promise we'll answer all questions, uh, but we'll we'll do our best to keep an eye on the Q&A box and pick things up. So put the questions in by typing them into the Q&A box uh, and uh, we will do our best to pick it up. So... To, to move to more of the substance. Uh, what, what, what do we mean today when we're talking about guerrilla tactics? It is, as I mentioned before, it's that possible frustration of the dispute board process by the use and abuse of procedures. Uh, and uh, the, the challenging thing is, of course, those procedures are there for a good reason. You know, that. The, the obligation to give people a fair hearing, for example, is there to ensure that everyone has a fair hearing. Uh, but does that mean an unlimited right to say whatever they want, uh, whenever they want, uh, despite there being a timetable which might have got, you know, uh, someone says this, someone answers, someone replies, someone might have the last word. It might have four stages of submissions, but if someone then uh, thinks, one of the parties then thinks of something else they would like to say later, is it fair or unfair uh, for them uh, then then to say, oh, hang on, I've thought of something else, can I, I, I want to say that, and then the other side will want to say, oh, but uh, you know, I need to reply to that, and then there'll be a, a response to the reply, and uh, suddenly instead of having four steps, you've got seven. Is it is it fair? Uh, to have that sort of use of an established process in a way which uh, interacts with, with uh, don't forget, the 84 days that we'd have under FIDIC uh, to run the whole process and, and have uh, John write the, <laughs> write the decision. It's difficult to write the decision on the 84th day if you're still receiving materials on the 83rd day, it's, it's quite tricky. Uh, so um, how do you distinguish use and abuse? Uh, and you know, what's, what's, the, what's the difference? And if there is a difference, does it really matter? What's, you know, what's the sanction? What can happen if there is abuse rather than only use? Uh, and I, I should also say that we're not here uh, considering things like fraud or dishonesty or uh, deliberate deception. Uh, that's that's not what we've got in mind in the topic we're talking about today. Although those are big topics and important topics, but we're not discussing them uh, in in detail. If they come up, um, all all well and good. Uh, so um, I, was, I was going to uh, stop talking myself for a little bit um, and talk about the procedural rules a little bit. Uh, the procedural rules, uh, let's take FIDIC as a base. You'll, you'll know that uh, the procedural rules are uh, part of the standard form. They're sometimes amended, but mostly not in my own personal experience. Uh, and so we've, we've got a set of quite short procedural rules, uh, which, which everyone uh, follows. Uh, 
Uh, and, and John, perhaps I can turn to you. We've got the procedural rules. They, they, they've got a, a, a set of approaches and um, processes inherent in them. Is it easy to tell if someone's um, just trying to use those legitimately or if they're perhaps going beyond that and trying to gain tactical advantage, which is unfair rather than fair? Well, thank you, Andrew, and um, good day to you and to Victoria and to everybody who's tuned in. Thank you very much to, for doing so. I recognise a lot of the names, and some I don't, so it's nice to see you. Uh, the answer to your uh, question, Andrew, is it easy to see when somebody is really trying to abuse the situation? I think the short answer is yes. Um, it, it, this will generally be somebody trying to set a tone earlier on and uh, if if the procedural rules which are being bent are to do with the timetable that's usually the area in which people will try to uh, gain some kind of advantage uh, in other words uh, to delay, to get themselves more time and perhaps to put more pressure on the other side the claiming party is extremely unlikely to want to abuse uh, the time because they want their claim heard and dealt with and to get a decision, preferably in their favour. So it's likely to be the responding party who are going to attempt to put up some kind of obstacles. Um, Andrew mentioned the FIDIC rules just now, which I think are the ones where probably all familiar with, but if you've got a pen ready, I'll give you the um, reference to the ICC's rules, and then you can make a note, make a mental note on a piece of paper a bit later, and uh, you can go to them. And the great advantage of the ICC rules is you can download them free of charge. So that's me for a, a minute or two anyway, Andrew. Okay, uh, Victoria, um, did, did you want to say anything at this? Well, from a from a from a lawyer's perspective, I think um, you you really want to keep the DAB members sweet from the start. So you don't want to be giving the appearance of trying to disrupt the procedure in any way. So if you were going to do that, you want to do it a little bit more subtly. But, uh, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Keeping the DAB sweet. So let's let's assume for a moment that you've really managed to get right up the nose of a, a, a DAB. You've really irritated them. Do, do we think the DAB reaches a decision that's different because of that? Well, one would it. hope not. <laughs> no, well, look, um, you're dealing with human beings here and we all meet people who don't need to use much effort to get on our wick. Um, that's life. Um, somebody may uh, do things which you wish they wouldn't, but you can't show annoyance. That's the last thing you want to do. You might, you might go away and say to your two colleagues that somebody's really trying it on, and it stops there. That's in private, but it doesn't alter the sort of decision that you have, and you you certainly don't try and put pressure on them. But the, the logic of the argument and the facts of the argument, they're, they're what they are, aren't they? You know, the contract provisions say this, the, the facts are that. If you put those together, you get to a decision. And the fact that someone's been really irritating in the way they, they've described their part of that to you. Uh, uh, I, I, I've heard it said, not by me, actually, but I'll, I'll repeat it. I, I can't tell you who said it either, but... Uh, if there's the benefit of the doubt to be given, that it's quite human to give the benefit of the doubt to the person who hasn't been irritating, not to the person who has been irritating. Well, that's a very sweeping statement and certainly not, not one that I would subscribe to. So say so you're going to get people who are helpful and some people who aren't so helpful, um, but you just have to take them as they come. And, and 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 as a lawyer, why take the risk? You know. Yeah, I 
I, I absolutely, I'm, I'm there on that. Why, why, why take the risk? Uh, uh, but there, there might be a reason. There might be a reason if, if you're, um, if you're responding to a claim, uh, and you'd rather not pay it. Um, you, you, you might want to have a reason somewhere not to pay it. Um, do, do you think respondents ever go into into processes having that mindset? I, I um, it's again a very general question. I, I think I think you, some do. But yes, yeah. yes, I think I, I think some people do, and and that begs the question: why are they, why have they agreed to a dispute board process in the first place? But it does happen. Yes, John. Did, would, well, I, I don't know what psychology people come into it with, because don't forget, for a lot of the time, we're at ad hoc boards. So we've never met these people before. So we don't really know what their agenda is. Um, we presume that the main part of their agenda is to come out of it with a decision which suits them. But whether there are other things at play in their minds, we don't know. What I would say is that when you get to see how people behave, um, any so-called misbehaviour may go to the credibility of the party putting certain views forwards. Um, it may be that you start to detect that somebody is just doing something for doing its sake. Um, and on the other hand, you, you know, you may say, well, somebody's actually got quite a good point here. So once you get to know people, you get a feel for the way they are. Um. Yeah, I, 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 I'd agree with all of that. I, I think the the risk taking element of it is really the question. You know, is it worth the risk? Because if if you don't want to pay as a party, if you don't want to pay, you're, you're faced with perhaps making a payment. Well, in the end, you probably just don't pay. Um, breaching the contract provisions, arguably, and having the sanctions uh, inherent in that later. But but do you need to manufacture an excuse? And one of, one of the things we we, uh, we had a speaker's meeting before, and one of the things uh, that I think, John, you said was that sometimes what can happen is that the parties start playing the referee, not the ball. You know, they... They start um well that's right and actually that's not a bad thing to do because i suspect that there are quite a few people listening here who are a bit like me who will watch sport and if you sometimes see a game of rugby which is an international game with quite complicated rules and there are all sorts of little bits of maneuvering and things that are being done that the referee will penalise you for. On, an, on another occasion, you may find that a referee will let it go. So it's a good idea to make sure that you get some kind of understanding what the dispute board is like. Uh, have they turned down my application for more time? Have they allowed that more time for this? So, you know, don't do something that delib is deliberately going to cause trouble. So, but um, the the um, guerrilla tactics we'll, we'll come back to uh, in, in a short while. That, that, uh, you know, uh, um, not not a how to session. I'll just repeat, not a, not how to session. Uh, but we'll come back to what some of them are. Um, Victoria, I, I wanted to turn to um, ethical. Uh, conduct requirements and um, just to look at those for a moment about uh, let's start with the dispute board members you know what they're subject to when it comes to this sort of thing yeah so as this it's a, a, a obviously it's a drbf event uh, we're here so i looked at the drbf code of Con uh, code of ethics and and this is what it says in in that document board members must avoid the appearance of any 
actual conflict of interest during the term of the dispute board. Dispute board members must disclose before their appointment any interest, past or present relationship or association that could be reasonably considered by a contracting party as likely to affect that member's independence or impartiality. If during the term of a dispute board, a dispute board member becomes aware of any fact or circumstance that might reasonably be considered by a contracting party as likely to affect that board member's independence and impartiality, the board member must inform the other board members and disclose the matter to the contracting parties. So that's what the Code of Ethics for the DRBF says, and it's focusing heavily on independence and impartiality, which we will come back to uh, later in the session. But there's also, and it's often overlooked, there's also many professional um, duties by um, professional organisations that focus very he heavily on the integrity of their professional members. So I looked um, at, at various uh, professional bodies' um, codes of conduct, and they all pretty much say the same thing. I looked at the ICE, uh, the Institute of Civil Engineering, and it says all members shall, shall discharge their professional obligations with integrity and shall behave with the integrity in relation to all conduct, et cetera, et cetera. RICS had something very similar. RIBA, again, impartiality and objectivity. I won't quote it all. Charters Institute of Arbitrators as um well, both before and throughout the dispute resolution process, a member shall disclose all interests, relationships and matters likely to affect the member's independence and impartiality, etc. And, and even, even for lawyers, the SRA, we have to, under the uh, Solicitor's Regulations Authority, we have to disclose any, any um, conflicts of interest as well. But the, the question then arises that if there is a breach of one of these professional codes, what does it what would complaining about that actually achieve because there are sanctions within the professional bodies themselves but that's not going to render any um dab null it's unlikely to render any dab decision null it's unlikely to make any dab uh, decision challengeable um even if the bias is divisive and would it would it make a difference maybe if the um the decision was unanimous then there would still be two against one so what would it achieve basically uh, john uh, on on parties the party representatives uh, again thinking about uh ethical conduct requirements are, are there any well in um uh... Victoria was right. She referred to the RICS, and they're pretty tough, actually. They um, they will take any complaint seriously, and if it's upheld, that could result in suspension or even expulsion. Charter surveyors are supposed to give advice in an independent fashion. Obviously, a DB member is supposed to behave in an independent fashion anyway. But I think it goes a little bit beyond that as well, is that if people start to think you're biased or you're biased in favour of some party or some group of parties, that's the sort of thing that gets around. And it is not going to do your reputation any good. And if your reputation starts to lose its, um, shall we say, gloss in the eyes of people, then that's not going to be very good for you. So you really need to watch your step. I did say I'd give you the ICC uh, rules reference, um, iccwbo.org, and it's a rather difficult site. So do what I do, just go on and search for dispute board rules, and it'll take you to them, and you can download them. The NEC contract um, now mentions DBs, but they don't mention any rules. There are no NEC rules and they don't refer to any. So be, be a bit careful if you use an NEC contract. So the, I, I'm just thinking about the difference between ad hoc boards and standing boards. And uh, let's, let's 
work on the rarer of the two, in my experience anyway, the standing board. Um, and so decision number one comes along, uh, the uh, decision's issued, one, one party gets something, the other party doesn't get something. Um, say the party that lost says, oh, that's, that's a breach of the ethical requirements of your profession you know, because you, you've in, in some way been unfair. Uh, and then there's a second reference. Um, so they, they've, they've introduced some sort of concept of ethical conduct, but there you are uh, saying, <laughs> no, it's all, it's all completely ethical. Um, but but that's the background to the second reference. So there, there are two ways of looking at it. There's something in the allegation, in which case it's uh, it, it may it may be unfair, or they've just said it without believing it, uh, and they're trying to generate a situation which uh, somehow upsets and disrupts the references. What what to do as a DAB member? Well, uh, in regard to the um, remarks that they make about the decision that you've issued and complain to you that you, you're being unfair, well, you're not interested because you're functus officio. If they've got a problem with that particular decision, then they've got to take it to the next tribunal, which is probably going to be arbitration or it might be a local court or something like that. As to what happens after that, if you think and feel comfortable with your decision, then that's it. These people are appointing you to decide their disputes for you and whether they like it or not, so long as you get to it in a, a way which conforms to the rules, that's that. But I would say that, you know, if you're worried about what people think, well, if you go through life without upsetting anybody, you're ineffective anyway. So somebody's going to be upset along the way. But the person you've got to live longest with is yourself. And as long as you feel comfortable with the decision you've made, well, that's as far as it goes. They've got a complaint. They go to the next forum. Victoria, any thoughts on that scenario? Well, from a from a party perspective, I think you, you've you've got various options, haven't you? You 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 either make the point and and hope that it will be fixed in in some way going forward, or or you just simply refuse to participate, non non cooperation in any in any future dispute boards with that standing uh, dispute board. Um, refuse to implement any decision that they've made. Um, I think those are the options, really. We've yeah. got a question from Moeen, who says, what if a member has served in past as a DB member for a party? Can it be strewed, construed by the other party as a conflict of interest? It might well be, because it might suit the other party to be um, casting doubts on your uh, impartiality. But look, this is a small world. You meet parties here, there, and everywhere, and their representatives. It is not unusual for you to be on a DB with one party and then come up with, uh, find them again on another project. Uh, so I, I think we could probably take that uh, question as, uh, and, and move down with, we, we you'll be pleased to know we're professionals. We've prepared an agenda. Uh, and later in this agenda, there's um, appointment of DB members as a topic under discussion of some uh, possible guerrilla tactics. So let's let's go straight there. Um, and Victoria, um, it, it was about, within the overall topic of challenges to DB members, and the, the first part of that, of course, is the appointment. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can, I can, I've got some, I've got some notes on this. So, I mean, the, the, the challenges to DB members that I see most often are challenges to their, or their proposed DB members, at least, most often are um, independence. And that's usually an objective test, whether there is, as a matter of fact, a relationship between uh, the DB member and one of the parties, for example. Um, impartiality, and this is normally a subjective test, is a state of mind, for example, whether there's actually any actual or apparent bias, are you perceived to act for the favourable to a contractor or perceived to be favourable towards the employer. Um, I was reminded of the case of Kofley against um, Tony Bingham in, in 2016, and in that case, uh, Kofley succeeded in the removal of Tony Bingham as an arbitrator. This was not a DB member, but as an arbitrator on the a grounds of apparent bias. So on this um, impartiality matter, because the evidence showed that Mr. Bingham had received 18% of his appointments and 25% of his income from ca cases involving um, the second defendant's Knowles. Kofley had uh, reasonably sought to obtain further information about the relationship uh, by Mr. Bingham, but he had avoided addressing those requests and effectively cross-examined, apparently, Copley's counsel in an aggressively and hostile manner. And in doing so was descend, and this is what the, the, the court found, was descending into the arena of inappropriate, in, in an inappropriate manner. So basically, he there was a perception of uh, impartiality, but he made it no better by refusing to answer any queries about his possible impartiality so so just just to play um play with the idea uh for a moment uh, would would it be fanciful to think that some people might deliberately try and provoke the uh the members of the dispute board into conduct which would then if you wrote it down and then read it later look like they were cross at one party sorry can you repeat the question so <laughs> could it could it have been a deliberate bait you know here's the bait i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to accuse you of something and because it's uh, almost um it, it, it's it's an accusation of bias at the very least but it may be an accusation of something even worse uh, and so it's quite a personal accusation. And some people might respond quite strongly to having personal accusations put to them. Uh, and so you, you might be after the reaction from the person rather than really believe in the substance of the, the thing you're saying. Of course, of course, that's possible. But one would really hope that the dispute board member would conduct themselves in <laughs> in a much better way. I mean, maybe maybe John can comment on that further. Well, yeah, I mean, in situations like this, um, I often do what a lot of overgrown schoolboys like me do, which is to use a sporting analogy. Now, I appreciate that a lot of you listening may find the, uh, the game of cricket rather difficult to understand, but you may know that it's played with a very hard ball and that some people bowl the ball in a very fast fashion at a chap or lady at the other end called the batter. And if you're at the batter's end and you have bouncers, beamers and other unpleasant bowling uh, thrown down at you, uh, well, the thing to do is to make sure that you do not pass and the initiative to the bowler by showing that it upsets you that you get on with it, you treat every delivery uh, on its merits or lack of merits, and you just get on with your job. I've, and, and actually, most people who see that they can't ruffle your feathers give up, as they see it just isn't working. So apart from anything else, it's much better for you uh, to just say, okay, well, he wants to do that, fine, Let's just turn away, walk away and come back and face him again. And you'll probably find that he stops it because he's wasting his time. <clears throat> um, 
So, so I can continue with the other challenges, if, yeah. if, if that yeah. suits. So we, we've done independence and, and impartiality, which was the Kofley case. Expertise, you can sometimes challenge the proposed nominee on the basis that they, they don't have the necessary expertise in the particular area. I'm thinking, for example, if it's a hydropower project or uh, rather than a legal, you know, a legal requirement. Um, qualifications, if they don't have the necessary legal training whether they're available i mean availability that's a really important one at, at the moment in the in the you really particularly for standing boards you need somebody who's committed and has the time available price i mean what 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 is that dispute board member proposing to charge some some of some dispute board members charge very highly indeed that we, we've noticed um so that's sort of common background challenges. There's there's also uh, in the in the FIDIC Red Book, for example, the, the general conditions of the dispute adjudication agreement sets out some uh, specific requirements, and that if the dispute board members don't meet those specific requirements, you can challenge on those bases. I'm, I'm looking, for example, clause three, independence and impartiality. Clause four, have no financial or other or other interest. Um, 4b hasn't been employed as a cons uh, or as a consultant for any one of the parties 4c um any professional or personal relationships um yeah 4d is also um it's 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 similar that's um been employed as a consultant or or an employee um hasn't entered into any discussions on the topic 4g um etc cetera, etc cetera. in in that's that's in the fidic dis, uh, dispute adjudication agreement obviously that can be amended but um if it's a standard form there also something that's really useful to look at is and this is in relation to arbitration but you can use it for for dispute boards and that's the iba guidelines of on conflict of interest in international arbitrations and you might this has been around for a long time. I think it was originally published in uh, 2004, something like that. It's been recently republished, updated just in February 2024. And some of you might know it as the traffic light rules. So it, it gives you really helpful guidance as what as what seems appropriate or not appropriate for a, um, a, a dispute decider, shall we say. And the, the traffic light rules, um, there's, there's four, broadly four categories. The first is a, a red red non-waivable category and uh, items under that uh, an arbitrator should not act then there's a red waivable uh, category and in 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 those uh, situations an arbitrator may act if the parties agree um i'm saying arbitrator because these are rules for mm -hmm. arbitrators but can be applied um to dispute boards um, then there's a an orange category, and this is the most common one that we see. The categories under orange: an arbitrator should disclose and may, in the absence, uh, and may act in the absence of any objections. So the the adjudicator should disclose it and then take it from there. And then green, and there's there's no duty to disclose at all. And that's that's really useful when you're deciding how to how to challenge um, uh, a proposed member. I mean, that's that's a whole bunch of people from different jurisdictions getting together to discuss what a conflict of interest is. And uh, and so the, the, the publication sets out a considered view from different places about what, what a reasonable expectation is, because I think there are cultural differences about uh, what, what constitutes a, a conflict of interest, what, what might be okay in one jurisdiction raises suspicions in another. And it's it's um, difficult to come to an absolute answer on, you know, what's right and what's wrong there. And, and that's why the IBA rules are helpful because people from all of those different places have come up with, you know, a compromise basically in the middle. Yeah, and they can, and they can be it's persuasive, can be persuasive. Hmm. Maybe, Victoria, you'd like to answer a question here from oh, somebody called El Kirang. Sorry, sir or madam, you don't give us the first name. The question is, at what stage or time do you disclose your possible conflict of interest? All the time. So from the start and if any, right at the very start, and then if any new conflict arises during the, the course of your, your appointment, if you're subsequently appointed. 
If in doubt, disclose. When in doubt, put it out. <laughs> it, even though it will mean you don't get as many appointments uh, because uh, you, uh -huh. you, you, you then get to complete the ones that you've got. <laughs> But you get the right appointments by the people who don't want somebody who will favour them. Um, so so uh, th there you are. You've, you, you, you've sent them your CV. It's got a, a, a couple of one-line comments which refer to something general. And one of the parties writes back and says, I'm interested in this. I want, I want lots more information about this. Tell me all about it because I'm concerned there might be a conflict. What, how, how, is that another one of those things that's inviting you to be tripped up? Or is it something that's got to be answered in, in, in the detail that's requested? Victoria? So the, the dispute board is asking you for further details? No, the party. The, part, the, so the, the party is asking the yeah. dispute board member for further yeah. details. Well, um, I, I mean, th this is where Tony Bingham f fell down, wasn't it? He 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 tried to be evasive, and and not provide the information. Um, I, in my opinion, the 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 dispute board potential dispute board member should be as open and transparent as possible. And when I have had similar correspondence with, for example, arbitrators who used to be TCC judges, they are very transparent. I mean, they, they take any conflict of interest very seriously indeed. And I would follow that uh, precedent, I would suggest. But what if at the end of the correspondence they say, from what you said, it seems to us you've got a conflict of interest and you shouldn't accept the appointment? Well, well, this is for a question for a dispute board member, as opposed to yeah. a, a lawyer. Um, yeah. um, and 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 then I think the dispute board member has to take it on a on a case by case basis to see on you know on what basis whether there are proper grounds or not proper grounds for for that. Um, and so, having decided that there are not proper grounds for that, then the, then the dispute board member needs to take a, a view on 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 whether it's worth taking the appointment at all, or whether it's going to jeopardise any decision in the future. Um, yes, that, and I, 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 so if if one was a guerrilla trying to wage warfare on the process, um, my, my experience is that dispute board members, prospective dispute board members, in that situation do tend to have in mind the process, protecting the process as well. So it's not only the interests of, of one party or the concerns of one party, but also the process itself, which needs to go on. Uh, so is it going to jeopardize the process to accept it? Or is it going to serve the process to accept the appointment? And um, so it's, the, the gorilla can find that the appointment goes ahead anyway. Well, may I just suggest that in a situation like this, as with all other issues, I would invite comment from the other party because yes. you know, that may well start to um, uh, sift out any kind of, um, uh, what should we say, shallow uh, reason for wanting somebody not to be there because if the other party says, well, we don't mind this person being here, um, we've worked with them before and they're beyond reproach, well, that's fine. If they turn around and say, no, you're dead right, we don't want them, well, you know what you've got to do. But ultimately, they're the appointers. You can't tell them what to do. If, if you don't feel happy with me, um, you have to say to yourself, well, if they're not happy with me, perhaps I shouldn't be here because they won't trust me anyway. Um, just on the traffic light uh, concept, uh, Hartmut Brühl asked you, Victoria, if you can share the link to the traffic light concept. Um, y yes, but I'll have to do that afterwards. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm old school and I've got a paper copy. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure any time will do. <laughs> if you, if you uh, Google... IBA conflict of rules. Uh, one of the results at the top of the Google search will give you 
um, the, the link to the IBA site and you can download them there. It's on the IBA site. Um, and Andrew, just just on your point, it's, it's maybe worth mentioning here that, that um, I, I did once complain about a dispute board member and um, qu query um, his independence and impartiality. So he had 28 years of experience. And of those 28 years, his CV showed 27 of those years involved in some way with the entity that formed the contractor. OK. And I wrote and I and I didn't I didn't find out about this until he had already been appointed and was some way down the line. I wrote and I complained. Or well, I complained. I asked for further information and um, he provided further information that was not to my satisfaction. And and he, he just refused. To, he refused to step down, um, mm. at which point I think I lost quite a lot of faith in the process. Mm. Do you know, I sometimes think to myself that one good test of the fact that you're impartial and don't favour everybody is when you get what I often get, and that's a notice of dissatisfaction from both parties. Well, once once one party served one, <laughs> might as well um, on the other side. But um, mm. yeah, uh, so I, 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 you know, that that's that is being even handed. You're 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 quite right. <laughs> um, can we can we look at procedural steps infringing a right to be heard? So, in my introduction, I, I said you know four steps: you claim response. Uh, response, response. Um, there's there's a thing I've seen done, which is the complaint that there's an infringement of the fair process and of the right to be heard by not accepting late material. Um, John, what, what do you think about that? Well, I start um, at the very beginning um, by telling people that... Um, they will all get a chance to have their say. They will all get a chance to put in their written submissions. And if we have a hearing or meeting, uh, they will all be given the chance to have their say without interruption and to respond to what the other side says. Now, I then go on to say, if you have any complaint about um, the way you're being treated, or you feel that you're not being given a chance, would you please say so at the time? Don't wait until after you've got a decision that doesn't suit you and then complain about it and complain about me and give yourself the problem of trying to go to an arbitral tribunal to get the decision overturned or nullified or whatever. Um, at the end of it, I do the same. At the end of every hearing, I say, is there anything else anybody wants to say? And if um, there's nothing there and we get to the point where there's the rejoinder um, which has been issued, I do say I'm going to take it that that's the last submission because time is running out. One reason for a DB decision being declared null and void is that it's issued out of time. So please don't give me on what you called, Andrew, the 83rd day out of 84, because there just isn't time to deal with it. But please, at any time, let me know at the time if you think that I'm being unfair to you. I, I've had that question from uh, decision makers, and it, sometimes it's a slightly unfair question because they haven't made the decision yet. So you, you, you're you left thinking, we, we made brilliant submissions. We had all the facts on our side. The, the engineering's all on our side. We're, we're going to win. Uh, but there were these couple of things where we were treated a bit roughly. Um, so uh, uh, back, back to the risk management. It, it, is it more of a risk? Uh, just to let it run when we think we're doing okay anyway, or not to complain when someone says you this is your last chance to complain. But it, by the way, just before I'm going to make the decisions. Um, so you know, if if 
if they were going to be influenced by you saying, well, I thought, I thought that bit you did wasn't right. You know, you, you didn't give us the, the fair decision. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer sometimes from the party's perspective. Well, I think if anybody says, uh, yes, we do think you've been a bit unfair to us here, then I would say to the other party, well, would you like to comment on that? And then see what happens out of that. And then maybe you can give the complaining party some reassurance that you're not actually being unfair. It's just that they they don't agree with you. Well, you know, not everybody agrees with you anyway. Um, but if they say, no, that, uh, well, they can't come up with a good reason to, to show that you're being unfair, you can say, well, I do feel quite confident that I can carry on. I, I think I've given you every chance. Um, I'm going to skip a, a couple of things, John, and go to jurisdiction and come back to you because I know we've had some questions about jurisdiction as well. Yes. We've got nine minutes left, so it, it, it's probably about time uh, to have a look at the uh, challenges to jurisdiction elements of, of the talk. I know you've had some things. Yes. Well, um, this has become a kind of art form, really, in, in UK adjudication. It's um, something which happens almost as a matter of course. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, well, this is the lawyers at work, and then you get other people who would like to think they're lawyers, so they raise jurisdictional points. Um, the first thing uh, is that um, any challenge to jurisdiction needs to make, be made early. I had one once raised on day 59 out of 84, and I said, well, okay, I'll hear what you've got to say, but on that alone, I could rule you out. Um, what is the actual point that they've got to complain about? Is it because a dispute hasn't crystallised? And you may want to listen to that. Is it because no notice of claim has been sent in at the right time? Is it that the um, presentation of a claim hasn't been made within a particular time? Were either or both of those conditions precedent? Has the matter been referred to the engineer under the 2017 books for his determin or her determination? So you need to look into them. Whether a dispute is crystallised, that's something you're going to have to form a view on. So you ask the other party, and then you can go back to the first party, and then you've got to make up your mind, and you need to do it fairly quickly as well. Um, sometimes, I regret to say, people are a little bit frivolous with these things, um, in which case you've got to say, without being rude to them, and say, well, look, I don't think this is a successful challenge and I'm going to go on, it does need a bit of robustness here. If you start wilting, then you're actually going to lose respect. Um, what I usually say is the rule is, unless you definitely think you shouldn't be there or you shouldn't deal with a point, stay there and deal with it. So you've got to be strong, but you have to, you have to make sure um, that, that that you deal with this fairly. Um, Romano Alioni apologised that he couldn't um, attend this, but he did make one point, which I thought was actually quite a good one. That if you take a recording of a hearing or a meeting, uh, you can hear their jurisdiction on the record. And I have actually done that recently. I, it was quite a heated meeting. But at least I got a record of what was said, um, so that that's that's quite a good bit of practical advice. We have had a few people um, actually. Uh, so, but but before you go through the questions, John, um, yeah, uh, I was going to turn to Victoria and ask if she wanted to say anything about jurisdiction. The, the answer can be no. <laughs> yeah, yeah I well, I don't have very much to, to say on jurisdiction at all, but I agree with John. It, it is much more common to, to raise jurisdictional arguments now. I think they can be wrapped up in, in, in the decision generally. They don't have to be heard as a preliminary matter in any way. So I, I guess it just adds to the dispute board's workload, essentially. Um, 
to, to uh, what 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 happens sometimes in other forms of dispute resolution is that there's an early hearing about jurisdiction on the basis that if there is no jurisdiction, you needn't go to the time and cost of considering the evidence and the outcome. Do you, do you think there's time to do that in a a, a DB process? Uh, uh it's 84 days isn't it it's it's a very it's a very tight timetable i've not acted as a db member so I'll, I'll defer to john on that well to be honest with you something like this is is something that the the complaining party is going to have in their mind and it's it's not asking too much to say well look this is only a page or two in writing and how long is that going to take you you ought to be able to do this within 24 hours and give the other side an opportunity of replying um, in practice, the other side will have their answer ready pretty quickly. So, um, you, you you know, just be careful not to allow it to mushroom and become a, a big and time-consuming argument. I guess you can ask for ex extra time as well, ask the parties to agree for extra time. Yeah, well, you can, but um, I have actually the, the non-complaining party might not want to agree to extra time just to accommodate the complaining party. Uh, I'm fairly strict, fair but firm. Um, so, the um, do do you think the challenges to jurisdiction are the result of uh, lawyers becoming involved, or is it something which uh, site hut lawyers become involved in, or is it? Uh, you know, uh, a commercial concern that drives it. It's 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 a little bit away from concrete and steel, isn't it? It is. I, I think in the UK that probably um, it was some lawyers who started it, um, and we'd better let people know that this, the site hut lawyer is something which dates from, from my um, youth. Really, that they're not lawyers; they just people who based on sight and think that they'd like to be lawyers and they're very often a blinking nuisance. Um, I, I think it's it, it's a little bit of a sub-industry and it, it sounds good to some people, but in actual fact, um, it, it's got a very short future, I think. Okay, well, well we, we, we've got a couple of minutes left. We, we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of it at a high level. Um, so let's catch up on the questions we can. Uh, Barry uh, Manny uh, asked, is it reasonable to insist that the chairman of a three-person DAB be of a different nationality to both of the parties? And Victoria, what do you think? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you can have a new, new uh, to, to, in, to request a, a nationality that's of neither party to, to, to be neutral, yes, no problem. You can request it. Say say you don't get it. Is it uh, is it unreasonable to refuse to go ahead? I mean, what you, what, do you, what do you mean? You you don't you don't get it. The party the parties are meant to to agree the dispute board member anyway. So you could just not agree uh, somebody that's uh, of a nationality that is not uh, of either of the parties. I think it'd be kind of unreasonable not to agree to that if you were the other side. Unless you were going to agree to it to be their party's nationality, I don't know. I'm I'm sort of with you on on that, John. I I, I don't know where you fall. You well, don't. Yeah, it's not a personal opinion, by the way. Just any thoughts? I. I <laughs> you can insist if you like. Um, the the chairperson is something that's in the gift of of the. Of, of the two parties as well as the two DB members. Um, if there is disagreement, yeah, it's probably best until you can find somebody you all agree on. You've got to, got to go a long way with these people. Um, last last question. Um, uh, Joe Kelly uh, said, do members need to be legally qualified as reference was made to this? If there are technical and commercial issues, would there not be a requirement for such a member to be competent in this field? And uh, so I'm I'm going to say something about that first. Um, I think the, the there's there's no need for any particular uh, 
qualification for dispute board members. Uh, you know, you don't need a formal qualification as a lawyer or a formal qualification as an engineer or a quantity surveyor or anything, in, uh, unless, of course, the contract says you do, unless the contract provisions change it. Uh, so I think it's more about can you do the job? Uh, can, can the can the person appointed actually? Yeah. Um, both the, and they've got two jobs. One is to run the process. The other is to make a decision. And if they're equipped to do that, then... Uh, I think it, that there isn't a formal requirement that they have anything else. Um, John, there's a, there's a uh, bit of a, sorry to interrupt, there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation though, because ideally you would want a dispute board member who is experienced in being a dispute board member. Yeah. But then everyone's got to start somewhere. So. Yeah. Uh, the short answer, Joe, is no. Um, but I think that you can take it that anybody who's on the FITIC list or who's got the fellowship of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators has already been through a few flaming hoops on um, the knowledge of the laws. Uh, and so we're uh, very slightly over time. Uh, and I'm sorry we've not answered all your questions. Uh, I, I hope that was of some use. And uh, I'd like to... Thank uh, Victoria and John uh, very much for their time and their preparation and the presentation. I, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. And thank all of you for attending. Thank um, you. Also. Yeah, thank you. And, th and thank you to um, Andrew and John. And thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I will leave it there. Thank you. Goodbye for now. Bye-bye.